Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, last Sunday morning. And uh, if, you, if you weren't here for that or you want to catch up on it, uh, go to the website. And I would, I would suggest that you just listen to the audio because watching that teacher up here, it, it's, it's ter- he looks terrible. I asked Brian, I said, can't we get some good looking guy up here to stand in for me so we all can dub in the talk later? He doesn't think he can, so anyway. When we, uh, when we look at what we've done in coming down through the book of Revelation and, and mapping it out as the introduction, the letters to the seven churches, and if you have not or are not familiar with Wilson Adams' little booklet on that, which also includes the short letters. He calls it postcards from God, if I remember correctly, or postcards from Christ. But these little postcards, these short little things in there that teach a lot, such as 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, Jude, and the seven letters to the churches. But we went through those seven churches uh, with Mitch and Sean and come on through the throne scene in chapters 4 and 5 and through the breaking of the seals and looking at the things happening there. And the progression with each one of those seals that was opened, different things happening from the establishment of the church to going forth of the gospel, and everything was done to block the spread of the word. And as we come on through the uh, trumpets, and notice that the progression there, everything keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Satan tries this, it didn't work, so he tries something a little bit stronger. Try something a little bit stronger. Stronger. So now, in chapter 13, we come to this point where we've got the great dragon from chapter 12 and the two beasts, one coming up out of the sea that we talked about Sunday and the one today we're going to talk about tonight, the one coming up on the land. And finally, chapter 14, uh, looking at the great harlot. And as I used to tell my students in electronics and physics, that is a very good question that you're going to ask or that you have asked, and be assured that we are going to cover that in great detail and very explicitly in a later block. Well, fortunately, as we are looking at the book of Revelation, we've got chapters 17, 18, and 19. And so a lot of the things that we talk about now is going to be amplified as we get on into these later chapters. So we're going to talk about tonight the earth beast. So just a quick quick bringing up to date. Throughout time, God has used the faithful to bring about his, his desires. And when we look at, at uh, through a, uh, Abraham and, and his sons and coming on through David and the faithful of Israel, being cared for and protected to bring forth the Christ. And at the same time, we could go back through and look at all of the times that that bloodline from Abraham through David to Christ looked like it was going to be stopped. But it wasn't. God protects his plan, and he protects his people. We look at the devil tried to destroy Jesus by the time he came to this earth. And hanging him on that cross and killing him uh, looked like the devil won, but he was defeated because Jesus was raised from the dead. He gave up his life willingly as a sacrifice, and he took it back. And so that proved that there is no power that the devil has over, de- uh, over us through, uh, through death as long as Christ and God are with us. But the devil, since he could not defeat Christ has turned his attention to God's people, which on this side of the cross just happens to be the church, us. The vision in chapter 13 is of two beasts. And when you you look at the literal rendering of that, that idea, it is talking about living beings. Things that have breath, things that have a heartbeat, things which are living, breathing creatures. <clears throat> the power comes from the red dragon. And the red dragon, as we have, have talked about and learned, is whom? The devil. 
Satan, the devil, Satan, uh, two, two words for the same individual. One of them means he's a liar. That's diabolos, devil. The other one is he is the adversary. He is the one that makes the charges. He's the one that stands up and says, this individual sinned, therefore his soul belongs to me. And then you've got Jesus who is our advocate who says, no, my blood bought this individual. But Satan is still making that charge. Individual sin and even God. Satan has brought charges against God, which is the subject of another time. But these have worked together now. The living creatures, the two, the one from the sea, the one from the land, work together under the direction of the red dragon to defeat God's chosen people. And this is the, the, the powers that are working against us. <clears throat> when this beast comes up out of the sea, we notice that, that, or we talked about the fact that being of the sea means that this is something that touches all of the land. And so this is looking at the powers that are given uh, throughout the, the land, and, and in essence is governments in, in particular, and this time we're talking about which government? Rome. Does it still affect our government today? Yes. Even though it was written against Rome, what did Solomon say? Nothing new under the sun. What was then is now and it will be in the future. So even though these things are directed at Rome, they have an application toward us today in that respect. But the beast comes out of the sea is a new power that represents the beast that is in Daniel chapter 7. Remember Daniel chapter 7, there were actually four beasts. It resembles a leopard, it has feet like a bear, and it has a mouth like a lion. And the four critters in Daniel that represent the nations that were depicted in the great statue shown in chapter 2 just happened to did I hit the right one? Have the, now the, the beast with seven heads, it can think and reason with ten horns, it has ten crowns and diadems. And did I hit two at once? There's the one I want. <laughs> when you look at, the, at the, the beasts that are described in Daniel chapter 7, when you get to chapter 8, he's talking about the same nations but the beasts are different with different characteristics for what he's trying to talk about at that time. Here we're talking about power and force and, and uh, ability to, to uh, conquer. You've got Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, who is representative of the lion. You have got Medo-Persian Empire, which is representative of the bear. And even though Persians were fine at making rubs and or rugs and uh, beautiful gardens and things like that, they didn't have a military might. But when they joined up with media, that gave them the strongest army in that part of the world at the time. And so the bear, representing the Medo-Persian uh, government, and the leopard, which is in chapter 8, the very speedy animal from the west that comes through and conquers everything. So there's the leopard, the lion, and the bear, which are the same exact animals that are duplicated in chapter 13 with the sea beast coming up. But then we look at what this sea beast can, is, he's, he's not four different ones. He's got all of those characteristics wrapped up in him, plus the terrible animal, the terrible beast, which is... Uh, representative of Rome, who is stronger than all the rest and is able to trample down all of the rest and rule as though with iron. <clears throat> and so this is the picture of the sea beast. All of these things in Daniel talks about wrapped into one. <clears throat> now like I say, the seven heads indicates that this is a critter that can assimilate information 
and he can think, and more precisely, he is devious. What do we say about foxes and things like that? They are cunning. They are sly. They can do all kinds of things because of their thought processes. And so with seven heads, uh, this, this, this animal can reason rather well. He has ten horns with ten crowns or diadems, uh, indicating that he has got what kind of power? Pardon? Kingly power. Kingly power. He has sovereign power, if, if we want to use that term. Who is the only true sovereign? God the, Father. God the Father. Okay. The only true sovereign is God the Father. Even the Son and the Holy Spirit are below Him in that. They derive their power and authority from Him. But this, this is representative of the kind of power and authority that an individual on this earth is either given or takes. So as it continues, he is able to blaspheme God. He makes war on the saints and attempts to overcome them, us. I'm going to put us in there instead of them. And he causes all the saints to worship him, or he tries to get everybody to worship him, but who does he not have power and authority over? The who? The ones God and Father are as Mark. Okay, but who are they? The church. Who has sovereign authority over the church? Jesus the Christ. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What do you say? All power and authority has been given to me. When you get into Paul's letters, you find out that that means anything and everything that affects the church, Christ is in charge of. And that is the protection and everything. And since he defeated Satan in raising from the dead, he has no power whatsoever that he can use against us. And even though he might be able to kill the body, what can he do to the soul? Nothing. We're not looking for a physical home. We are looking for a spiritual eternal home. And nothing that Satan or Diabolus can do can take that from us. <clears throat> but in the end, since they cannot harm us, their efforts through all of history are in the end futile. And they themselves, in the end, will be destroyed. And we see that two times in chapter 13. <clears throat> In chapter 13, continuing on down from verse 11 on, uh, looking at the beast that comes out of the earth. Now back over there at the bottom, I put SPQR. Anybody know what that means? Pardon? Mark of the Legion. What does it stand for? <laughs> Sinatonis Plebiusque Romanus. The Senate and the population of Rome, or the Senate and the people of Rome. And sometimes it, it included a four in the front of that. In other words, whoever carries that mark is for or in behalf of the Senate and people of Rome. Where was the mark placed? Who had the mark? If you signed up to join the Legion, It'd be right there. You would have the mark of Rome. It was a tattoo. Sometimes it was tattooed, sometimes it was branded. Now, when you look at marks, what do marks mean? Of what? Okay. When you look at somebody that's got these things on, you know, for real, I, I retired from this in 87. But what did this mean? Authority. authority. And it had different levels of authority. This particular one, I had uh, authority over all of the maintenance on the south side of Luke Air Force Base. 
we go through life and we have other little marks and symbols. We've got little, little things that go on one side and little things that hang off a pocket and we've got others that, that show various aspects of whatever. What do they mean? You can take these right here and lay them on the counter of a coffee shop and you still got to cough up $5 for a cup of coffee. But they are a mark of a job that has been given or a position held or who you belong to. Allegiance to. And that was like that S SPQR. It was tattooed on. Most people think it was on the right side, some say it was on the left. Some say that people were tattooed on the earlobe. Whatever the case, a slave was also tattooed to identify that he, who he belonged to primarily. And even the cities and towns throughout the Roman Empire had a mark to determine whether they are a Senate-controlled city a emperor-controlled city, or were just a common belonging to Rome city, and didn't have the protection of either the senate or the emperor. And so marks in Rome are very, very important. And so when we get into chapter 13, and we start talking about the mark of the beast, what's the first thing everybody wants to know? What, what, who, who is number 666? Well, ain't a he, I'm sorry. It's not a he. It's an it. And it is the royal power of Rome as pushed and, and influenced by this land beast that we're going to talk about. The second beast... When he comes up out of the earth, it says that he has two horns like a lamb. What's the picture? Is a lamb, what kind of an animal? He's what? Very peaceful, docile, in many instances, afraid of his own shadow. If you're a newcomer and he kind of comes up to you, just stamp your foot and what happens to him? He's, he, he, that's, that's total panic. But what happens when he opens his mouth? He speaks like the dragon. What's the month of March back east? It says he comes in like a, and goes out like a, that's the beast of the lamb. Perfect, perfect image of that. Comes in, looks like he is docile, looks like he is is uh, everything is, is no problem, and all of a sudden, he is a wild, raging beast. Somebody didn't turn my iPad on. When we look at the second beast, and reading beginning in verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast. Wow. How much authority was given to the first beast? Okay, but what did, what did that have to do? How much, how much of power and authority was given to him over the earth? The, it, it, was, it was, okay, still answer the question. How much power are we talking about? How much power, how much authority, how much did the devil offer to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? All. Bow down and worship me and I will give you all of this. So what it's saying is that the first beast had power and authority over all of the nations of the earth. And the second beast has, through that first beast, the same power. The red dragon delegates power to the one beast and it delegates power to the second beast. If you can follow that line of reasoning.
If I were to tell you that the UCMJ derives its power from the Constitution, the military folks in here would understand what I'm saying. But as, as we go through the, the laws of the land, all of the various laws that are made, even the speeding tickets that they all offer out here, where, where do you go to for the ultimate authority for that? The Constitution of the United States, which authorizes certain individuals to be elected to go make those laws. And you as the electorate put them in office to make those laws. But all of that power and authority goes back to the Constitution. What it's saying here is all of the power and authority of all of these evil nations and influences in the world goes back and gets its power and authority from that red dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first dragon in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Okay, there's your first clue. What kind of a critter is this second beast? He's evil, but who makes whom to worship? Religions. First beast is the political power of the lands. The second beast is the religious power of the lands. I'm going to have to write a blog on the association of civil governments to the local churches that can uh, that, that, that say that they are community churches. Who every time something happens, the governor calls in the leaders of the churches and says, here's what I want you to preach Sunday. Here's what I want you to ask your congregation to do. Here's what I want them to donate to. Is that civil government influencing religion? Is that civil government offering power to religious organizations still today? I say that because we're running out of time. <clears throat> Watch what's coming. The, sea, uh, the land beast uh, causes it, the inhabitants to worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it, dece it deceives those who dwell on the earth. So what power does he have to perform all of these seeming miracles? Pardon? Where did Simon the sorcerer in, in Samaria Get his tricks. Sleight of hand. Where's the magician get his tricks? Sleight of hand. I know a couple of preachers that were as, as good of magicians as they were preachers. And an honest individual will tell you that these are tricks. We are tricking you into believing what you are seeing is real. But it's not. It's a trick. But it's through the trickery that Simon was able to influence the people of Samaria. It's through trickery that the religions of the time were given the power and the authority by the state to perform such tricks. Let's see what they do. Telling the people it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give birth to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and make cause, or <clears throat> might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So the question here comes in, who is the beast? And everybody remembers the Caesars through your study of ancient history in high school. Who is known, which one of them was known as the beast? 
Which one? One in who? Nero. Nero. Nero is known as the beast. Uh, not only short, stubby. We won't, no, we won't go there. We won't look at appearances that way. What what he was though was brutal. Uh, he was almost like Herod in that respect. What was said about Herod? You're better off to be his enemy than a relation. Nero is the same way. You know who did, who who did Nero leave alive? Well, see, he killed off his mother, killed off his wives, killed off his close associates, killed off his... He was the very last of the Caesarian rulers. Starting off with Julius Caesar, family line coming on down through, Nero is the last. Nobody of the family left to inherit. Rome went into great turmoil when he died. He killed himself. He committed suicide with the sword. Vespasian was brought back from Jerusalem, left Titus down there to destroy the temple and the city. Vespasian started building a Colosseum. Titus used the money from the gold in Jerusalem to finish that building. Titus dies. His brother Domitian comes to power. Domitian makes Nero look like a wimp in that respect, if I can use that term. Hopefully that's not, now we won't worry about it. The, you know, I, I, I try to be politically correct in these things. Don't, don't, don't laugh now. But the, the fact remains that Domitian was much worse in many respects than Nero ever thought of being. And so there was a, 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 a certain element of society at the time that says, well, the beast is dead, that's, that's the one that got struck according to Genesis chapter 3 when Christ broke the head of Satan. Okay, there's the death blow on the Roman Empire. But lo and behold, here comes a worse than Nero emerging a few years later in the form of Domitian. Who is the very first one to start demanding that people worship him in temples. When we look at, at how he came up to be and establishing his priesthood throughout Asia Minor and the rest of the world, demanding that they build temples and offer sacrifice and offer incense and then take a little bit of that ash that's left and put it either on the forehead or on the hand somewhere. He used, he used the religious influence of the land who was with the people to influence the people to bow down and worship him. That was Domitian, first one to go that far with things. And when we look at what Paul says with regard to these false agents uh, in, the, in the church at the time, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. They are disguising, they are deceitful. They, they show up in sheep's clothing and turn into wolves who devour. No wonder, for even Satan does what? Disguises himself as an angel of light. Him and his agents are disguising themselves. Okay, the beast comes up out of the land, and what's he look like? A lamb. What is he? He's a terrible monster. Therefore, it is not surprising if his agents or his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. These are holy men. They got the robes on. They are leading the people. When they used to lead them into sacrificing to idols, they are now leading them in sacrifice and offerings to the Roman emperor. There's the beast of the sea. Here's the beast of the land. They're now combining their efforts together under the direction of the red dragon 
take over the minds and the will of the people. And what's their end going to be? Their end will be according to their deeds. In verse 10, we've already said in verse 10 that the sea beast is going to be destroyed. But what's it going to take for the perseverance of the saints to come on through? The same is going to be said when we get on down into the latter portions. So, second beast is exercising all of the authority of the first beast, which is power over the nations and people. It is causing all to worship the first beast. And the thing that is being worshipped throughout the land, and we've talked about it as we looked at the seven churches, is there's an influence out there that if you do not toe the line and follow the religious order of the time, what happens? Can't work, can't eat, going to die. So both are incomparable. What was said about the first? Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Verse 4. They both speak against or the God. They speak great things and blasphemies. Verse 5. That is, they're arrogant, they revile God, and they push forward the emperor who's the only true God. Satan is driving these two enemies. They cannot be defeated by physical means. Right? So let's see, all of these religious wars that we've got going on in the world, what are they going to do? Except for killing each other off. They're not going to accomplish anything in the end. They are defeated by Christ and his angels. And that's that spiritual war that's going on to this day in that other realm that we cannot see. <clears throat> now, a couple of, couple of things to look at here. In Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15, he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him. As we've talked about with God uh, directing Satan, Satan was limited in what he could do to Job. Satan is limited today to what he can do. The only thing that can be done by these people is what can be done in physical means. They have no spiritual weapons to use against you. They can't take they can't take your salvation away from you. They can kill the body, but they can't harm the soul. And all that's left to them is physical deceit. They tell those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause as many as do not worship the beast to be killed. Can you imagine a temple built and an idol in that temple and a priest standing behind it through a blow tube so that the sound comes out the mouth of the beast telling you what to do? They make movies about that kind of thing. But it happened. It causes all the small and the great, all the way from the, the kings to the slaves, the rich, the poor, the free, the slave, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And I won't get into what happens on Ash Wednesday to a lot of these congregate, a lot of these religious orders that come out with a black mark down their forehead. It happens today. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one that has the mark, either the, na uh, the name of the beast or the number of the name. And here's where we start getting into the, the idea of that, uh, that mark. What are the consequences of not submitting to the beast? The end result is you can't survive. You either starve to death or you make such a, a pain of yourself that they kill you. 
death, power to kill the body is the only weapon they've got. It causes all small and great to do that. Okay. And then it says, here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. And with that statement, people have spent their entire life trying to figure out what name is derived by taking numbers and placing them in as letters for 666. And it goes the gamut. When I was a kid, I was once, back in the 40s, World War II was going on. Who was the big enemies? Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo. No, that was the three Axis leaders. And people would beg, borrow, and steal just to cram their letters into that 666, trying to say that they were the beast. It doesn't work. They take Nero's name and put it in there. Well, the first thing you got to decide which language you're using. You're using Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, what? It doesn't work. It just keeps going. So what do they really stand for? The only thing that you know for sure is 666 does not refer to any spiritual being or any demonic being. It is something of human origin. And that's the only thing you can know for real. <clears throat> Number 12, how many apostles did it, were there? 14, how, how so? How many at one time? 12. Judas left, he brought in Matthias, back to 12. James is killed, you bring in Paul, back to 12. How many people were necessary to develop the nation that brought forth the Christ? 12. That number 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 occurs all the way through. It is a good number, but 6 is half of the 12. It's a broken 12. Godly success is 12. Broken is 6. And so when we look at that 6, we're looking at 6, we're looking at 60, and we're looking at 600. <coughs> 666 is the number of the beast, and it is judge world power. It contrasts with this number of 144,000. 144 is 12 times 12. 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10. There's your perfect numbers of 12 and 10 multiplied. 666 is 6 and the units column, six in the sixties column, and six in the hundreds column. What's it saying? It gets worse and worse and worse with time. Didn't, isn't that what we've seen with the opening of the seals? Isn't that what we've seen with the trumpets? And guess what you're going to see with the bowls of wrath? It is a compounding and a getting worse. Couldn't accomplish the objective by killing the Christ. So he attacks the people of Christ. Has no success there. What do you do? You expand it on out. You keep increasing the severity of the, of the oppression and the extent of it. We're running out of time. David, uh, David was one of my mentors. His brother Robert wrote this commentary, which is available through Truth Bookstore. And he goes into this idea of the compounding of the number 666. You need to, to read and study that if you're really interested in that number. You know, it's identifying of it. But what I wanted to get to is this one right here. This is a, a tourist map of the city of Ephesus. And when you look at, you look at the things that are available in Ephesus, and this is one of the cities in uh, the seven churches of Asia, and it's one that's directed at if, if things are getting bad, what's the, the result going to be? No work, no livelihood, death. Why? Because you're not worshiping. Number 19, right there, is the Temple of Domitian. It's the first one. The second one 
is Trajan's Fountain, memorial to Trajan. And then following Trajan is the Emperor Hadrian, and guess what? Number 14 up there is Hadrian's Temple. Which one's missing? Which one is not there? Which one cannot possibly be the beast? That guy. There's no temple to, to Nero. And our classes are coming in, so I've got to quit, even though I've got another three hours to go. So. I'll let Sean finish, finish this up and, and continue on in chapter 14 next week.